have a fascinating uh, conversation for you today. OBIE and UK Finance are concluding their consultation, which is an absolute game changer for our industry. So it's a super important that we have all the stakeholders involved and publicly let them have their say. Now at Open Banking Excellence, OBE as we affectionately call it, we're the voice of the global open banking community and as such we believe this is an important conversation to bring to you. And it's one that we want to continue, whether that be on our blog or uh, with more round tables. So we've got all the stakeholders um, or a cross section of, of representative stakeholders gathered around uh, um, today. So let me uh, just introduce our runners and riders. And I am delighted to um, have Jana McIntosh from UK Finance, Stephen Wright from NatWest. Stephen um, has um, attended our campfires before, so welcome back. As has Hattel Popat from HSBC. Alan Ainsworth from OBIE, um, Imran kicks off our campfire every year in January. Brendan Jones, hi Brendan from Consensus, and Dan Scully from Money Hub, representing all the TTPs and giving their insight. And Dan was actually at our very first OBIE, OBE, getting my uh, acronyms mixed up. Okay, so <laughs> let's jump straight in. And we've agreed to disagree and to be provocative and not to shy away from the difficult questions. So uh, this one, uh, Jana, I'm gonna ask you to kick off with. So as we know, OBIE is currently governed by the CMA and it's funded by the UK's lar nine largest banks and building society, collectively called the CMA nine. So how do we reconcile the latter point with market development in a sustained, fair, and competitive market. So have OBIE, have, we, have they been given a head start, Yana? Uh, I mean, I, I'd say that the CMA and the CMA9 has been absolutely instru instrumental in, in helping establish and develop a market as we know it today. Um, this did stem from a CMA retail banking investigation where there was a desire to promote competition. But I think we are five years on and the market has broadened quite substantially, both from the developments that we've seen, but also the different type of participants that wants to get involved. We have more than 700 different participants now wanting to involve and engage and have built propositions on the back of this. And the propositions themselves have evolved from kind of what we've seen in the beginning to kind of considering developments around base of smart data, the pensions dashboard, open finance propositions. And so I think now is the time for us to kind of think about kind of what that future needs to look like. And any future organisation, I think, will now need to kind of like capture um, and kind of help reflect that kind of much broader landscape that we have. Um, but I think what we have today and kind of like having the CMA and the CMA9 establish what is a world leading market and open banking, I think it's kind of helped the UK kind of put us on the map. So now is the time just to think about how we evolve it. I'm going to come back to the world leading um, because I do think it's important we take this opportunity to fly the flag. I'm going to come back to that um, in a moment, if I may, Yana. Um, I wonder, Brendan, do you have something to say around, um, you know, the sustained, fair and competitive uh, manner? Yes, I do. And thank you. I, I do agree with, with Yana's comments. And, and I think, you know, if we look at the UK market today, the success we've seen is, is unprecedented to anywhere else around the world. And, you know, that, that is obviously predicated off the back of the, of the CMA order and, and the nine banks funding it. But... I don't think it's about the past. I think it's about looking to the future. And, and, and where we are today, I, you know, I, I have an issue that I don't believe the CMA order has yet been served because there's certain infrastructure services that are being delivered into the market that are completely no competitive organisation can, can enter into. And obviously I represent Consensus, which provides directory services. And when, when we look at the market, I, I struggle to understand moving forward when I look at the um, UK finance recommendations of how it's taken an entity that exists today, which was funded by the CMA9, um, taken a dominant position in the UK market, which I'm sure wasn't the intention of the CMA when they put the order into the market, but then is potentially being carte, given carte blanche to 
extended its operations into other vertical markets within the UK, but then also potentially create a commercial arm for it to then go and sell its services outside the UK. So not only as a UK company do you feel hindered in your own in your own market, potentially, potentially. You're be fighting um, another UK company that's arguably had a degree of state sponsorship behind it. There inherently seems to be something wrong in my mind. Interesting, and I did ask everybody to be provocative. Stephen, um, in that west part of the CMA9, what's your, what's your view on this one, please? So my view, and I kind of agree with Brendan's point about looking forward. So, and I think in your question, you didn't really carve out the fact that although we fund the OBIE, the OBIE was set up as an independent organisation with independent governance from the CMA9. We just fund it because we're required to by the order. Um, that independence will still survive in the future organisation. And that's kind of a, a key kind of um, principle there. Also, we want to diversify the funding. So the funding actually represents more of the ecosystem and the kind of member participants in your organisation from banks and all third parties. And I think addressing kind of Brendan's point, one of the things that definitely I would be interested to see is that the new services co does deliver value for money. And part of that I see is actually looking at some of the services that are provided today and potentially kind of looking at commercially outsourcing them and looking at tenders in the market, looking at what's the best in the market. And OB, the new OBIE becomes a kind of procurer procurement interesting perspective um operation for some services yeah that is interesting okay Hattel this is a question I want everybody to, to chime in on um because we're not going to get a chance for everybody to to answer all of the questions but Hattel I genuinely would love to hear what what you have to say on this so I think if we look at what's gone well the fact we've had a single body helping to coordinate activity across the UK with the nine banks fully invested, thanks to the CMA order, but many, many other institutions coming to the table voluntarily, I think has really enabled us to make progress. And when we look to some of the European markets, and luckily in HSBC, we do have a very large footprint, so we do see progress in lots of other markets. The lack of a coordinating party has made it harder to get PSC2 and open banking off the ground. We're confident they'll get there, but it, it, it has taken longer because there isn't somebody to drive it along. So I think OBIE has fulfilled a, a really useful purpose in doing so. Um, I think it's fair to say that Brendan's comments are, are well placed. That there are inherent um, monopolies in providing these services because it makes sense for the ecosystem to have a single supplier so that we can operate efficiently. We now need quite rightly to think about how do we manage those monopolies in a way that's fair for the wider market and doesn't create permanent um, asymmetries. And I think Stephen's raised some, some good suggestions on how that might be managed. So I think there's, there's, there's a number of points to, to bring to bear here. I don't think breaking things up and going to a completely market-led model would work. We do need a coordinating actor still in the UK, I would argue. It doesn't make sense, for example, for NatWest to develop variants to the standard to suit its future use cases and HSBC to develop separate variants. That would be inefficient for TPPs who are trying to then work with us both. So we do need to be coordinating ourselves. But we do need to do so in a way that is pro-competitive for all aspects of the ecosystem, not just competitive at the bank level, but then anti-competitive at other layers. Okay, um, Dan, um, we looked at uh, TTPs there briefly. You have been in open banking since the very beginning. I'd love your insight, please. So I think um, I think our view would be first of all, let's let's remember why we're going about this in the first place. It's to provide better competition and ultimately better outcomes for consumers and SMEs that make use of these services. Um, so with that in mind, I think it's really critical that we keep some level of independence about uh, the central organisation that looks after this. I mean, my personal view is I'd love to see them continue to report into the CMS or 
even maybe into this um, FCA, given what a forward-thinking regulatory body we have, I think it, they would be a great home for this to sit under. Um, I think sort of building on one of the points that Stephen um, referred to about funding, um, there's been a lot of discussion about funding, um, but I think if you dig deeper into the true cost of open banking, a lot of it was uh, sunk into lawyers explaining why we shouldn't be doing open banking in the first place. The implementation took months. Uh, if, if truth be told, and uh, if the truth of the January the 8th, 2018 was that everyone was compliant, then uh, it didn't take very long at all. Of course, nobody was compliant on in January 2018. Um, and, and there is a school of thought that says we could have funded this and more through fines of those that weren't compliant with the ecosystem. I think we'd have a surplus of funds if we did that and we'd, we'd we have time to, to run on. It also would sharpen the pencil of the people not complying, of course, if they were being under the threat of a fine. So I think there's a lot of models we could talk about in order to make this self-sustaining. But the ultimate one for me, and to, to ensure we get the right outcomes for the, for the end users, um, let, let's make sure that it's done in a fair and um, transparent, independent way. Fair, transparent and independent. Alan, I have deliberately uh, left you uh, to be the bridesmaid to, to, to follow on at the end. Please, you have the right of reply. Big, big Thank questions. You. Thank you. I mean, I, I think the, the context I wanted to paint is a positive context and building on what a number of people have said in terms of the success of the UK model. And Hetal mentioned the difference between the UK and the EU, and, and, and Jana mentioned it as well in terms of a UK success story. And just to put some numbers to that, around 450 different participants, recognising some of those are still in sandbox, um, but, you know, 300 active participants that aren't in sandbox in the UK. Uh, 3 million individual users, and that number going up significantly over time, so we're very keen that we, we are going to be announcing another milestone in the not-too-distant future. We're starting to see payments take off. We've got, you know, it's a small number and we're starting at a very small base of about a million payments a month. So really good success. And I think it's something to, to recognize the success. It's still early days as well with those numbers, but it is very successful. And as, as Dan has said, I think if we had been at compliance levels on the, in January 2018, we may have bigger numbers there. You know, when I look at some of the things we're doing on the roadmap, I still see, and you can argue about the specific figures, around about a third of transactions not getting through to the end. And we call that the consent success rate. Around about two thirds get through, around about a third don't get through. And we're still struggling to understand entirely what the reasons for that is. But we're not there yet in terms of the obligations under the order that the CMA9 have got to perform to. We weren't there in January 2018, and arguably we're still not there in 2021 all the way there we have made significant progress and i want to underline that too but but it's a success story and my key demand is that whatever comes out of this maintains that success story and builds on it because it is a success story and let's understand why it's a success story some of the differences between here and the eu and hetal mentioned some of them we had an implementation entity that is one of the reasons why we've got such strong levels of implementation to the standard. That was funded, and thank you very much to CMA9 for funding that, but it was funded well. There were sufficient funds there to do the job that needs to be done. And we had effective supervision. So we had supervision of the nine to ensure that those APIs were usable by the organizations creating propositions to customers. All those things are really important when you start to look forward. And when you look forward, you say, well, we still need to do all those things. We still need to have strong levels of funding. We still need to ensure that the ongoing obligations of the CME9 under the order are met. But even more importantly, that there's, there's sufficient momentum continuing into open finance. And I've kind of written down three Fs here. Forward looking, a focus on making sure we're delivering the obligations under the order and also getting that funding right. We might get into the funding models that have been proposed by different actors. But for me, I think it's really important to recognize that having effective funding 
is a key linchpin of being able to do what we've done in the UK. If you don't have effective funding, you may not be able to do all the things that we've done. One of the things that we do, we've talked about supervision already. We talked about, a number of people talked about bringing the ecosystem together. Okay, and that's a really important plank of what the OBI has done. An example was when um, we, we had the EBA announce in the summer of last year that certificates of Q issued by QTSPs would be revoked once Brexit happened. It was a risk. We knew that risk was going to, to be there. We didn't expect it to happen in quite that way. But the OBIE came together, brought people together and worked out how to get that done. Yes, the FCA changed the rules, but I think the OBA played a pivotal role in getting that done. Now, that today is funded by the CMA9. I totally agree with people to say that that funding base should be expanded. Totally agree with that point in principle. But the problem is, if you don't fund that kind of ecosystem convening piece, then it doesn't happen. And you, you stall progress. And what, what I really want to understand, and, and it's great to have so many CMA9 people on this call, what would be really good to understand is who funds that going forward? Because I see a commitment of funding for three years from CMA9, but I don't see that as a service necessary that you can charge directly to A or B type of participant. So who funds that ecosystem work to make sure that ecosystem issues are dealt with and resolved if all you're doing essentially is funding services that are provided to individual participants? Who funds all that work? A, a great question. Um, who funds it? And um, with, with the um, <clears throat> consultation process likely to be concluded towards the end of, of this year, um, will there be a gradual slowdown? Stephen, do you have a comment, please? I don't think there'll be a slowdown at all. Um, we've already got outstanding items from the um, CMA order roadmap still to be delivered. So that work will continue. At the same time, um, there is a look ahead to open finance and the kind of growth of other API services, commercial APIs in the market as well. Um, you are seeing more and more participants in open banking, um, more and more banks acting as both AISPs and PISPs as well. So the blurring of whether I'm an account services provider or whether I'm a third party these days is a bit kind of um, ambiguous because we're both and we have interests in both. Um, I also want to see the same kind of bringing up CMA9 to the same level of performance and availability kind of applied across the wider um, ecosystem as well. Because I think that's the other thing that needs to be fixed is that you've now got an island of CMA9 amongst a whole sea of um, other providers out there as well. So I don't see this slowing down. I see, if anything, it continuing and accelerating. Okay, interesting. I want to go to Dan, then Hatel, and then Yana. Dan, um, an island of CMA9. Well, I mean, we're, we're connected to over 100 institutions in the UK alone for um, open banking. Um, so I wouldn't say it's, a, it's an island. Um, and there's definitely pros and cons to, to all of them. Um, there are some smaller players, smaller than the CMA9, that are much better performance, much faster response times, much better um, consent journeys, all evidenced by you know, the data that we can supply. Um, but of course, you know, the CMA9 also have a, a, a really you know, big role to play um, because they've got the biggest voice and the biggest brands in order to be able to help consumers understand. Um, and look, I, it's very easy to, um, to kind of push for better and faster and more, but they've got big complex systems to manage as well. And we have to acknowledge that. Um, but no, I think what's fantastic about open banking is it, it could have so easily just, just been the, the CMA9, but it's become so much more, so much quicker than I think any of us expected. And what was really great was the follow-up um, was much faster. You know, it took the, the other banks a lot quicker to get to the same levels of standards. So that's been positive. There are definitely a few out there that are not quite right. But anyway, that's a different rant for a different day. So big brands, big voice. Hattel, um, HSBC, colossal global brand and a big voice. Um, 
Alan asked about funding, uh, but maybe you'd like to comment on slowing down post the consultation. Yeah, let's take both questions. I think the funding question is really the wrong question. I think the question is who, who gets value out of this? Um, if you look at this as a tax, which is the way the OBI is structured, it's a tax on the nine um, to, um, for a short period of time to create something, to create a standard that could be used by other firms for free, then that's an appropriate way of um, intervening in the market, which is why the CMA did it for a period of time. If, you, if the suggestion was that this is a permanent tax on large institutions to subsidize other business models, which compete against them, that doesn't seem to me to be a, a particularly sustainable or sensible way of operating. And, and just to put it into real numbers, you know, OBIE, according to its annual report it published in January, um, is costing £10 for every single customer that's currently using it. And that's before we um, include any costs borne by either the TPPs or the banks themselves who, who then provide the services over that network. That's a fairly heavy cost. So I think we do have to ask the question of where does value get created and how, do, how does that value then um, equitably get distributed so that, that then funds the services that make that value happen. I think if we kind of move away from that, I think slowing down is definitely not where any of us want to go. The, the point of the CMA Open Banking Remedy and PSD2 more widely was to catalyze an ecosystem that has now account holding institutions, whether that's banks or credit cards or otherwise, um, consumers of that data or those services, which is TPPs, often banks and credit card firms themselves. Uh, you know, we're a TPP operating, providing payment services as well as account information services to customers. And once you create that ecosystem, the expectation by all the regulators and policymakers was industry would then, in a very constructive way, build on that. A good conversation is when Dan's firm talks to Stephen's firm, they co-create new products and services that benefit our shared customers, because that's what they are, and they find a way to do something which helps customers and creates value. Ideally, someone will be charging those customers in a transparent and fair way so that everybody is a winner. That's where this needs to get to. The point of Open Banking PSD2 creating a baseline free to TPP service was kickstart that ecosystem. But, but if it's a car engine, it should be humming along at 1000 RPM, waiting for someone to come along and put their foot on the gas and start to move that up. That should not be regulators, it should not be policymakers. If this is only ever something that regulators want, then we've, we've failed because it needs to be something customers want. So it now needs to be industry who drive this forward with innovation and build on what we've already done. There's lots of complexity. We will need government and regulators to help unblock some of the complexity. You know, there's things like GDPR, which are very sensible legal instruments to protect customers, but at the same time, sometimes make firms nervous in understanding what exactly is appropriate behavior. And so we need to work with our regulators to work out how do we create value, but in a way that's fair for customers and transparent. And that's a good conversation to have, but it has to be market led. Otherwise, this, this whole endeavour is a failure. Eloquently said. Thank you. Jana, before we move on to the next question, Hetel says it has to be market-led. Um, please comment on that. Oh, absolutely happy to. It was like he was um, completely kind of reading my mind. Um, uh, I mean, to your point about kind of, is this going to slow down? I mean, there, there is just no way that it will. I mean, this has been an absolutely transformative development that the industry and the CMA9 and so many different kind of stakeholders have invested so much into. Um, you now only kind of like see areas um, emerging where it needs to grow and it needs to evolve. And I think the fact that kind of Brendan wants to compete with kind of certain of the service capabilities within OBIE and the fact that Stephen wants to compete with Dan on certain of the kind of like propositions that are emerging to me just kind of means that there's a whole new competitive dynamic emerging out of what we have established. I mean, that for me is just the start of a market developing. It's by no means kind of like implying that it's going to slow down or, or in any way kind of like um, necessarily mature anytime soon. Um, but the key question is exactly what Hetel said. For me, kind of, if you think about those new incentives, think about kind of like the market in that competitive context, which we just kind of described in various ways, 
the question is who will drive it and the question is who who will be having kind of like certain responsibilities to Alan's question to perform some of those some of those kind of whether it's service capabilities whether it's kind of ecosystem um, kind of services and those are the kind of key questions because I agree with Hetal back to kind of like your opening question it's been kind of established and driven by the regulators but we're now moving into a space where it needs to be more commercial it needs to be driven by industry incentives it needs to be driven by what consumers and businesses want um, and I think that's why it is that this organization and the market that we kind of see evolving from this needs to evolve in a way that kind of puts the right framework and the right structure in place to enable and to kind of like help some of these competitive dynamics to evolve because in places where regulation was helpful to establish this what you don't want is for regulation to then kind of hold Stephen back from being able to compete or hold OBI back from being able to compete with Brendan and certain kind of service propositions. So I think it's a whole new kind of market dynamic and a whole new competitive dynamic that we need to learn to embrace. Um, it is a whole new um, market dynamic. So which is a nice move on then to, to our, our second question. And it is, it is that Brexit one, if we can remember that far back. Um, with the UK now out of the EU and with open banking standards being uh, fundamentally uh, written around the PSD2 framework, do we think that the future divergence between the UK and the EU, um, is that a, a challenge? Is it a threat? Is it an opportunity for the future of the open banking ecosystem? So, Brendan, would you like to kick off on that one? Yes, yeah, certainly. So <clears throat> I actually think that um, the opportunity for divergence from the EU is actually not a bad thing. I think if you look at the speed that the EU Commission runs and works, it's years with its machinations before things come out of the sort of the sausage engine and so on. And I think we've already seen within the UK the way the FCA moved to consultation on open finance that we've already stepped up a gear over and above that of Europe. I just want to go back to a point that uh, Hetal made, you know, HSBC being in many different countries. And, you know, there is no doubt that Europe is two years behind the UK in terms of its open banking adoption. However, there are banks out there that are seeing tens of millions of transactions in their own right now. So it is picking up pace within, within Europe. And that's a divergent infrastructure from what we have in the UK. But from a regulatory perspective, I do think we have the opportunity to embrace the open API economy and extract and drive better um, financial output and better customer propositions as we move forward. Interesting, thank you. Um, I'm just going to choose a couple of, of other people to comment as, as I want to uh, to finish on time. Stephen, um, as we come out of, uh, uh, well, we're out of the EU now, uh, um, is this a, a, a strength, an opportunity, a threat uh, for the um, open banking economy, particularly as we're changing gear? I see it mainly as an opportunity, and I agree with what Brendan said. And I think things like the FCA's current consultation, where they're looking at changing the guidance on 90-day re-authentication is a good example of that. And again, what they're doing on open finance and the consultation. Um, but I also think we are going to have to make sure that we don't diverge too far. So if you look at some of the payment schemes like SEPA, or you look at SWIFT, which is international, there's a point in time you've diverged too far, you start to be closed out potentially as a risk out of those international markets or international schemes. So you've kind of got the balance. There's got to be still be some alignment internationally while accelerating. Interesting. Thank you. Alan, um, key one for you here. Um, open banking standards created out of PSD2. And what's your view um, moving forward now we're out of the EU? Well, I think, you know, there are pluses and minuses, and I don't want to get into the politics of this. I, I do get that there are a number of TPPs recently announced setting up in other countries outside of the UK. I think, you know, when I look at that from an economic point of view, I see that as a disappointment. I think it would have been great to have kept those TPPs operating in 28 different countries based in the UK. I think that would have been great. And if the price of that is that we have harmonised regulation with a few idiosyncrasies, such as 90-day re-authentication, that's the price. That's the balance between being in a single market 
and having the flexibility to change your own rules. From the standards point of view, as I said before, we've had an advantage in having the funding to create a standard. We've also been able to essentially make that the ubiquitous standard in the UK with good funding and with the CMA order behind us to make sure that at least the nine go ahead and use that standard. I think at one point there would have been an opportunity for that standard to have become a European standard. I think for lots of political reasons primarily that never happened. But having a single community created standard is a real benefit for the UK ecosystem. And that is one of the downsides of the European approach where you've had, whilst you've had standards, they haven't had this mandatory layer to them and it's made it very difficult for a plug and play uh, ecosystem that we've had in the UK to take over in Europe. And I think that would have been a big benefit uh, if, if we could have got that. But I also have to take into account the fact that the open banking st standard is used in other European countries, not just the UK. It's used outside of the UK, particularly in the Republic of Ireland, but there are other places that have chosen to use the open banking standard. So we want to ensure that we can, you know, and the future entity will need to ensure that that standard complies both with what is required by the EU and the UK. Um, and, you know, Irish banks are asking that question. I think it would be helpful if when the future entity is set up, if the future entity can make it very clear that the standard will, will enable compliance with both the EU rules and the UK rules. Jan, before we move on, do you have anything to say? Um, well, I mean, so it's like with everything, where there's risk, there's also opportunity. And, and I, I actually hope that the divergence uh, helps us move faster towards some of the things we want to achieve, open data being the, the main goal there. Uh, and yeah, we're seeing some benefits with the with the 90 day reauthentication already. Um, of course, there's downsides. We've had to be one of those TPPs that's had to set up uh, an office in, in, in Europe in order to be able to uh, operate there. Um, and, you know, if, if we diverge away too much from standards, it does make it harder, but it, but it also gives us a good opportunity. So, you know, the UK is already ahead in PSD2, ahead of PSD2, sorry. Um, and we look at things like variable recurring payments and sweeping and, you know, we're in a really strong position to continue to drive out um, amazing innovation. And I call out to my friends and colleagues at the, uh, at the, at the ASPSPs and the banks to, 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 to keep on that journey to drive forward that innovation because it will unlock a lot of commercial benefits, both for, for TPPs, but also for the ASPSPs themselves. And I think that's the opportunity we've now got to move at a pace. Dan, I would agree we are in a, a strong position and, and something I um, talk a lot about when I'm talking to our community around the world and, and, and to regulators um, is that the UK, um, if you read the, the Finiton report, okay, uh, the UK uh, created the blueprint. That's what it says in the, in the Finiton report. It created the blueprint for open banking, something we should all be immensely proud of. Um, so we were the first. Yes, there was screen scraping. We all know that. But this gives us a huge depth of expertise and it's an exportable commodity for UK PLC. I truly believe we should, you know, do a bit of a flag flying here. Um, it gives us a foundation, though, to, to look back at lessons learned. So we're adults now. So we are changing gear. I would like us to actually uh, take some time now to look under the bonnet and what are the lessons learned um, from being the first, you know, look at what they're doing out at, uh, in Australia with, uh, you know, uh, consumer data um, um, and, and, and everything. What are our lessons learned and how can we apply those for this gear change? Jana, be delighted if you would chime in there, please. Mm, I'm happy to. I certainly have a few already kind of in the conversation that we started mentioning. Um, you know, the one, the one lessons learned and a couple of positive ones around this um, is around kind of the way that we've come together and the way that we've collaborated in doing this. Um, and you kind of often hear uh, on a different kind of um, uh, event that I joined this morning, people talking about kind of, you know, collaboration being the new competition. I think there's a, there's a way in which we've done that in the UK, which is kind of creating a very competitive environment, which is kind of my second lessons learned, um, which is a little bit kind of what was just said around um, the entrepreneurial kind of like innovative kind of culture that we've kind of built around open banking in the UK. Um, and I think for others kind of looking at what we've done, that is a key lesson uh, and the way that we evolve the system going forward for me kind of maintaining that culture of innovation is going to be absolutely crucial um, to the success of anything that we do going forward. Um, 
the other one is around what, what Alan said as well, a while for me is, is around kind of the way that we've developed standards and the importance of really good interoperable standards. Um, and I think this is again, just the start of kind of what we would need to do to keep evolving the propositions that need to develop on the back of what we've started. Um, and then kind of a couple of other lessons learned, I think, which comes back to the conversations we just had is around kind of the incentives we put in place, um, which comes back to governance and funding um, and the way that we kind of allow an industry to develop with these kind of more commercial incentives along a regulatory framework. Um, and I think that kind of balance needs for us in the UK needs to evolve, needs to change for us to kind of now keep abreast with what's happening elsewhere in the world, because elsewhere in the world, you kind of see it being developed from a more commercial kind of point of view, a more market driven point of view um, compared to our starting position in the UK and Europe. So, um, so those are a couple of kind of interesting lessons learned for me when I kind of think about the experience and the kind of journey that we've had today. We're always going to get whether it's market led or whether it's regulatory led. Um, Hattel, you've been in this from the very beginning, lessons learned and, and um, to take forward one of uh, Alan's Fs. So I think there's a, there's a few things that we need to, to fix for in the UK. When, when I see what's working in other markets to, that we operate in, they tend to have a broader set of products and services in scope for open finance and open data. I know Dan would certainly be an advocate of that to, to create more propositions for his customers. Um, I think there, just, just because this came out of PSD2, which is a payment piece legislation, it, it's, a, it's an unnatural boundary between payments and other products, which then restricts what we can do. I think mean, that's, that's something we need to work through. I think there's, there's probably a number of points linked to some of Brendan's opening comments around how do we, how do we think about this as a wider ecosystem? We've, we've turned this into a very simple worldview of banks, the thing in the middle and the TPPs and we need to break that thing in the middle into lots of different services and layers because this is growing into a really complex and rich um, ecosystem and, and, that's, and that's something to celebrate. I think we probably need to change the way we think about TPPs. There's a perception in in the way we all talk about this, the TPPs are all plucky little fintechs, and, and some are, and, and credit to them. But you know, one of the largest TPPs that, that I see when I look at the data for HSBC is NatWest Group, Lloyd's Banking Group, Barclays. So uh, some of the big credit card issuers and, and acquirers. So TPPs now are, include some of the largest financial institutions in the country, um, as well as the plucky little fintechs, and and so. Assuming that the right way to manage this is inherently biased against the big banks who should subsidize the TPPs is, is perverse because we're almost subsidizing our direct competitors, in which, which is, is never the right out outcome. So I think we need to change the way we think about the market structure to reflect what's really happening, which is that large firms are, as you'd expect, seeking to compete in this market. And, and that will then change the whole way the incentives are thought through. Interesting. Before we move on, would anybody like to add? I mean, I'd, I'd perhaps just challenge that a little bit in that if you can't compete with, with NatWest or Lloyds, maybe change the proposition rather than worry about the infrastructure underneath. Um, and I think that's where my slight worry about the, the way this is heading is, is that if the infrastructure just worked, you could focus on building great propositions with the Quite frankly, HSBC has got some of the best products in the world. So why would you want to compete on whether open banking is working or not? That should just be a given. And so for me, that's why I don't quite understand the, that, that, that argument. I completely agree that TPPs are a broad spectrum of very large to very small. And even the small fintechs are quite often like us powering very, very large multinational organizations. But but we should be competing on our propositions, not on whether open banking works or not. So get, get, get the car working before everyone can put their foot on the accelerator would be my sort of counter to that view. Yeah, Dan, if, if I explain what I mean. For, Dan, we're having... I was just going to explain what I meant there, Helen. For, it, at the moment, if HSBC wishes to offer services to NatWest customers, because we're operating as a TPP, we can do so for free. NatWest can't charge us anything for it. 
and vice versa. That doesn't really reflect the, the economics and the cost of providing those services to, to either party. And, and there's no reason why a large PLC like NatWest should be subsidized by HSBC customers or why HSBC should be subsidized by NatWest customers. That's, that's not, there's no inherent commercial competitive reason why we should behave in such a way. But because this ecosystem was con initially conceived of as plucky fintechs versus large incumbents, that's the market structure we've created. And all I'm calling for is, is a recognition that actually that isn't the market structure we now have. We actually have large financial institutions competing against each other, as well as fintechs competing with us. And therefore we need to think through what are the right economic incentives here to make sure this is you know, a level playing field and fair. And ultimately, we always have to remember, and this is the point I was making earlier about OBIE, there's always a cost that has to be borne by somebody. And if a firm is bearing a cost, ultimately its customers are bearing that cost because that, that's how business works. And therefore we have to be thoughtful in how we make those costs pass around the ecosystem and make sure they're fair so we don't end up with unintended cross subsidies between one customer and another. But can, can I add on top of that, Hotel though, but what services should you be funding versus what services should be commercially driven in the market? Where I think we've learned a lot, you know, I think OBIE has done a fantastic job in the market. And I do think that there is huge room for an organization such as that to drive, keep driving standards forwards for those new propositions and so on. But the funding of that central entity, it skews the market completely. If you allow competitive, competitive um, uh, organizations to enter into that space, by definition, you will get much lower pricing in the market which will then, as you say, will reduce costs for overall within the ecosystem. Now we're seeing that already developing in Europe. Why can't you allow that to happen in the UK? Why have the nine got to continue to be the main bearers of the brunt of the funding, at least for another three years, if not longer? Interesting. Um, Alan, I wonder if we could use that as a segue um, into, um, and Hetel and everybody has touched on this actually, um, how will the new operating model engage effectively with the ecosystem? And if we could combine that with, you know, at OBE, we like to be red hot relevant. And if we can look at, you know, what um, Ron Khalifa uh, is saying in his, his review and um, what the Chancellor said um, at UK um, uh, FinTech Week, which was a superb week run by Innovate Finance. So a bit of a shout out to Charlotte and uh, Janine and the team there. Um, can we just have a look at how this, this new world engages with the ecosystem and look at what the Khalifa report is saying, look at what we're doing with the FCA uh, scale up sandbox. How, how are we gonna foster adoption? How do we make it all glue? Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a really good question. And, and, and one of my answers is I don't know because we haven't seen the results of the consultation. I think one of the interesting things about the way UK finance have approached this is they've assumed that there's an, that there's an answer which is theirs. Um, and that's kind of guided a lot of their rhetoric. And I think it's quite clear to me that this is a consultation process and we don't know what the operating model is. So I just put that out there just in case people think there's a predisposed or... or, or, or pre-agreed resolution to a consultation, there will be a lot of, of, of views put into the CMA and we will see what the CMA says uh, when it gets all those responses in. What I think is really important, and you've kind of suggested this, is that we do need a pathway to open finance and smart data. I think it's really important that whatever the answer is in terms of structure of OBIE, that we have a clear route map to enable that organization and successful organizations of that organization to enable open finance and to enable smart data. And so, you know, I know that the UK finance proposal does talk about that. I don't think it talks about it enough. Mm -hmm. I, what, I, what I do worry about is that we end up with a very significantly scaled down version of the OBIE, which loses some of its capabilities and is therefore unable to take on the mantle of delivering open finance and or smart data. And, and one of the things that I'm very nervous about in the uh, FCA's response to the call for input on open finance is it talks again about industry led. And we've just heard from the CMA9 that you do need to catalyze a market to make it happen. You do need something to step in and make it happen. Now, I would argue 
that we haven't finished that with open banking yet. They would argue differently to me. I would argue that we haven't reached a space, I think it was, that, that Jana talked about where we're moving into. I think we're some way from getting to that space where we do need a different approach. But I do believe that when we have reached a point that the catalyst part of the role has finished, that we should therefore look at a different model. I totally agree with that. But what I do worry about with open finance is we haven't even started that approach and the FCA is talking about industry-led. And what worries me is that without something that looks a little bit like OBIE for open finance or smart data, that won't happen at all. And I think what you've heard from the CMI and people on this call is that wouldn't have happened in open banking. So why would it happen in open finance or smart data? I think that's a, that's a great point. Jana, um, if I could just ask for, for your comment on that point, um, which is one that you know there's been universal agreement on um, on this panel around around the table, and also how OBIE will collaborate uh, to foster um, you know the adoption of the new model, whatever that new model will be. Indeed, no, I mean, and, and I'd agree. Alan would be pleased to know that I also kind of think it remains to be seen. I think it's the start of a process of evolving what we've done with an OBIE into that new future model. It's not saying that we are already there, but I do think we need to have a stronger eye on the future. We need to start understanding what it is that we are aiming for and how we want these um, these services, these companies, these propositions to evolve and develop. So I think there's a there's a huge recognition that this is um, absolutely an ongoing dialogue. Um, you know, the consultation is still at the CMA should still opine, but the work that we tried to do at UK Finance was to say let's start having that conversation. Let's bring people together to start thinking about what we think the foundational elements should be. And I think in places where we've not gone as far as people maybe expected us to is because it still remains to be seen. I think, and, and we do want to allow this organization to own its own future. There's gonna to have to be a new board, a new management, a new structure, new incentives that needs to be developed so that they can own the future and kind of like help develop some of the services on the back of it. So you can't kind of be that definitive of what you put at, but you do need to kind of like help putting some of the kind of, you know, key building blocks, key considerations out there on the table so that people can start engaging on it. So I think it is hugely important and I think the fact that the Khalifa report and that kind of like the the, the UK kind of fintech week and that H and T kind of you know payments reviews every single kind of like discussion that at the moment kind of emerges touch on the future of open banking and for me that just kind of highlights the importance of this it hi and highlights the importance of of it to the UK economy and it highlights the board and the importance of it to to our sector um, and so because it is so important people kind of feel like we have to engage we have to engage with what we want that future to look like so that we can kind of drive it forward and so to your point around kind of how do we foster that kind of collaboration there's part of me sometimes that think like any other company should they need to be informed they need to understand the future they need to understand the demands from their customers they need to understand the demands of of consumers who want to use those services um but the organization itself need to put those structures in place to inform it and so whether that is through kind of management, through board structures, through engagement structures, you know, participant groups that we've kind of, for example, referenced in our report, I think the entity would have to kind of make sure that it can, it can have an eye on what it is that the future and what all of these different stakeholders is expecting of it. Um, whilst you've got the mic, Yana, um, because you're absolutely right, we are on a huge growth trajectory and it is exciting, it, it truly is. Um, I would like each one of, of everybody around uh, the table to, in a couple of sentences, to say, what does good look like in our brave new world? So, Jana, kick off. To use a Shakespeare expression, what does good look like? And I know we've got a lot of Caliban's, uh, but come on, what does good look like, please? Well, I will cheat and kind of like um, say that, you know, we've, we've kind of given this some thought when we kind of published our report in terms of, you know, what the vision of this entity should be and what it should aim for and kind of what we settled on was that it should enable UK consumers, small businesses and corporates to benefit from a highly efficient, safe and reliable open data environment um, to continue to build on a platform for UK financial institutions, which kind of has a lot of words in it. Um, but I think you can kind of unpack it and think about some of the key outcomes that I think for the industry would be absolutely essential. And key in that is adoption. You know, we need to kind of like 
find a way to kind of build infrastructure and propositions that can kind of command kind of widespread adoption um, and consumer usage across what it is that we did. And it needs to be highly secure um, and reliable so that consumers trust and want to use it. Um, so for me, those are kind of some of the key building blocks that we've thought about in terms of what it is that a vision and kind of outcomes for this entity needs to look like. Thank you. Stephen, what does good look like, please? Well, I think building upon what Jan has just said, I also think maintaining and accelerating the high level of collaboration across the ecosystem that we see today is key and kind of ensuring the right incentives exist to participate in a new entity to drive change forward. Um, and that's governance, that's funding, that's getting involved with the change process. And you really highlighted in what Jana said was the kind of positioning statement for the new entity is that focus on the end consumer and that focus on kind of the progression to open finance and ensuring that we are actually investing the entity's time in what is a priority for the ecosystem and for the end user. Um, if I look at what we've done in open banking, we've delivered some stuff that's barely been used. It has barely been touched at all. And you can't help but thinking if there was a bit more of a kind of discussion around what actually does a end user want to have the capability to do or what does a third party want the capability to do that might have been a better conversation to actually direct and prioritize some of the change than just a kind of blanket all approach um end users it's always got to be around what the end end user wants and i'm, I'm going to wrap up with that but just to continue with what good looks like alan absolutely key um you must have a very clear line of vision of what good looks like alan I think there's been some great answers so far. I, I like the, the vision that, that UK Finance have articulated. I think it makes a great deal of sense. I think it comes down to, you know, a, a Tony Blairism of three words, three priorities, adoption, 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 I think he would use. And I think, you know, this is all about getting consumers, getting small businesses, using helpful propositions that make it easy for them to carry out their lives and carry out their business. And the, the, the wider you make this work in terms of both open finance and smart data, the more that people can benefit from, from what has been created at, at a small level so far by the OPI and by the people on this call and by the ecosystem participants and just expanding that so more and more consumers and more and more SMEs can benefit. So yeah, I think I think a lot there's been a great deal of great comments so far and it's difficult to, to beat them. Adoption, adoption, adoption. Okay, that's uh, th that we should trademark. Hetel, what does good look like other than adoption, adoption, adoption? Um, I think it has to link back to customers' adoption, really. Um, and for me, it's good is when customers can't live their daily lives without it. So if at the moment we think roughly 10% of our customers are using open banking services, if you turn them off, 90% of your customers wouldn't even know it happened. That's that's not good enough. It definitely isn't what the CMA or the European Commission expected when they wrote the order in PSD2. It's not what any of us expected. I think we're running slightly slower than we'd have hoped. But UK consumers do take time to adopt financial innovation, even contactless, which seemed like such a simple change from chip and pin, took seven years and crucially London Underground drove that um, through its adoption. So maybe we haven't quite had that um, killer app which has driven adoption into um, our customers' minds. But when it happens, we'll know it. And at that point, customers will then say, well, I couldn't go back to the old way of doing things, logging into online banking and making payments manually. This is just the sensible way to do it. This is how it's going to happen. And I think that's success. So at least half our customers, digital customers, are using this as part of their daily lives. I think that's a really good yardstick, actually. Um, good looks like when our customers can't live without it. Brendan, um, thank you. Thank you. What's, what's your take on what good looks like, please? I suppose everything that everyone has just articulated, but from, from my perspective, it's um, an ecosystem that's open for all to compete in. That, that's really the message I want to put out there today. At the moment, it is not a level playing field. And if open banking is meant to be delivering better outcomes for everyone in the ecosystem, there are those that are being precluded. Is there anything you want to uh, to expand on that or does that say it all? 
I think that that really says it. I, 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 I want to see an ecosystem where everyone has an opportunity to deliver services and not be precluded from the market by an entity that has been developed by the CMA. Okay, so I want to finish on a high. Um, Alan said adoption, adoption, adoption. Absolutely everybody has talked about the use case. Uh, Hatel touched on that um, before. So as Open Monkey moves into open finance, um, you know, at OBE, we believe, you know, uh, to, to, to we want to inspire people to innovate is, is, is what um, we're all around. So I would just like to finish on a couple of great use cases. And I'm going to ask um, Money Hub, Dan. Oh, we okay. So um, we've been powering open finance for many, many years. Um, we lobbied for open banking and, and, and pushed forward with the standards. So we were big fans. Um, but, but actually, I think where we look at the direction of travel is open finance is now and open finance is happening now, of which open banking is a small part. Uh, it's been wonderful today to hear from everybody else. I think broadly we're all on the same page, uh, which is great. And I think what good looks like is when we start having conversations about the commercial opportunities rather than the regulatory standards. So some just some really great examples. We've got um we've got people in the pension sector using open banking to help spot opportunities to save cash now that you can save and invest into your future, helping people in the UK and beyond to have better long-term objectives, helping people getting out of debt, making better more informed decisions about how they spend their money and where they spend their money in order to reduce their carbon footprints. The opportunities that we've got here it is just absolutely astounding. And it doesn't really matter whether you're a tiny little FinTech um, making mortgage decisions um, in a smarter, better way using uh, affordability data, or whether you are um, huge international um, trying to move money around in a more cost-effective, quicker way, smarter way, and protect people from accidentally incurring charges they do not need to charge. Um, the future for open finance really truly is bright, I think. And we're not even scratching the surface of it. And I would definitely love to work with um, some of the ASP, PSPs so that we can change the conversation into how do you benefit from this to such an extent that you don't care about the cost anymore. Uh, and it's great because I think we're both, we're all saying the same thing really, just from different viewpoints. Dan, I can think of no better way to finish on the, the um, your line, the, the future of open finance is bright, unless anybody else has anything they would like to say. Okay, well done, Dan, that was beautifully wrapped up. And we didn't even rehearse that. Um, so this is a conversation that we are going to continue. And it's one that just listening to what everybody has said, we, we need to continue as well. And we're going to um, talk more about it at OBE and we're going to talk more about it on, on our blog. Um, so please do watch this uh, space. So clearly we've got exciting times ahead of us all. And I think that is the overriding message. We are changing gear and we have a hugely exciting opportunity. So uh, without further ado, I would just like to say thank you very much for joining us. Goodbye for now. Mm -hmm.